is chapter two that deals with chemistry. You really cannot separate biology and chemistry anymore. You have to have a basic understanding of chemistry and some of the chemical uh, processes to really make the physiology make sense. And so this chapter is just going to give a very brief overview of chemistry. It's not that we're condensing chemistry all into one chapter for you. We, we're giving you a brief overview so that everything else will make sense to you. So as we start this, this is something someone shared with me once to describe. They said if it's green and it wriggles, it's biology. If it stinks, it's chemistry. And if it doesn't work, it's physics. So I know a lot of people tend to have this fear of chemistry. I'm trying just to just let you know it's not that bad. Couple of definitions. We talk about matter a lot when we're talking about chemistry. You know, all that refers to is matters anything that occupies space and it has mass to it. It is composed of elements. It can exist in terms of biology as either a solid liquid or gas phase. So life requires energy and think of the cells as little miniature energy transformers. They're taking energy in one form and they're going to convert it or transform it into another form. And so when we're talking about energy, we're just talking about the capacity to do work. What are you doing? You're rearranging things. You're rearranging matter. Essentially, you're going to take an element from one spot and move it somewhere else. In terms, once again, of biology, we usually look at two forms of energy, kinetic energy and potential energy. Kinetic energy is energy of motion. And potential energy is stored energy. So for our purposes, we're looking at chemical energy, this potential energy that's stored in chemical bonds. You form a bond connecting two elements together. And from a chemistry standpoint and from an energy standpoint, we know there's energy in that bond holding two elements together. So if we break that bond, then that's going to release energy that the cell can use. So that's why it's important for us to look at. Now there's chemical energy that's stored in, in the bonds. There's electrical energy that's movement of charged particles. Mechanical energy is uh, directly involved in the moving matter. And then there's radiant or electromagnetic radiation energy. And this is energy that travels in waves. So we're going to be looking mostly at the chemical energy. So life as we know it depends on energy conversion from one form to another. Uh, you're going to take that chemical energy that is stored between bonds in the food that you eat, we're going to break that down and convert it into energy that allows our muscles to contract. So we're converting from one form to another. And if, if we can't do that, we're not going to be able to move, which is one of the characteristics of life, and life is going to cease. Thermodynamics is the study of this energy transformation from one form to another. Now one thing you have to keep in mind is the cells, just like a lot of things, are not that efficient in terms of transforming energy from one form to another. It's never going to be 100% in that transformation. In other words, you will always lose some energy in the form of heat. So if you transfer chemical energy to mechanical energy, some of that energy will be lost as heat. Now, I've been mentioning elements a few times. Elements, what is this? It's a substance that cannot be broken down to other substances by ordinary means. Now, you could do it by, by extreme means and go into even smaller components, but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about substances that cannot be broken down to other substances by ordinary chemical means. So when we are looking at biology, and certainly human biology, some of the major elements involved are things such as what's shown on this chart here, in that you've got oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, and nitrogen. Those are the four most common elements found in the human body. But then there are additional ones like calcium, potassium, sodium, 
magnesium, etc. And then there's some trace elements that are also found. <coughs> so what we're talking about is like oxygen. You cannot break oxygen down into smaller component pieces of the internal oxygen under normal chemical means. As I just mentioned, the most common elements are carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen. Some people refer to it or remember it by saying chon, uh, whatever helps you to remember it. Compounds are when you take elements and you combine them together in specific ratios. And we'll get back to compounds in a moment. Now, an atom. This is the smallest unit of matter that still will retain the properties of an element. So you can have a carbon atom. You can have an oxygen atom. So a carbon atom has the properties of carbon. An oxygen atom has the properties of oxygen. They contain subatomic particles which if you go into physics, you can study all kinds of the different subatomic particles. But in biology, we're going to keep it simple. We're going to say that there are three that we're going to look at. We understand there's more than that, but we're just looking at three. The protons, the neutrons, and electrons. And in terms of size, this drawing is just trying to give you a little bit of an idea of if you were to give glucose, which is a compound, it is a sugar, if you gave it a unit of one nanometers, an antibody, which is a protein floating in your blood, that's 10 times bigger than the glucose molecule. A virus would be 100 times bigger. A bacteria is 1,000 times bigger. A cancer cell would be 10,000 times bigger than that molecule. The exponents, this is how many zeros you're placing behind this number. So if you had a 1 and you placed 8 zeros behind it, so 1 million times bigger, that is the tennis balls compared to a mark. So we, here is water way down here, a tenth of the size of glucose. Basically, when we are talking about atoms and subatomic particles, which would be even further this way, we are talking very, very small. You cannot see them with a regular microscope. The subatomic particles, protons, electrons, and neutrons. The protons have a positive charge. They are found in the nucleus. Now, when we're talking about a nucleus here, we're talking about the center of the atom. We're not talking about the nucleus of a cell, which some of you may be familiar with. <coughs> we're talking much, much smaller than that. So nucleus just means center. So the center of the atom, and it, the proton does have some weight to it. The electron has a negative charge to it, and it's an outside of the nucleus. It, it's basically in constant movement around the nucleus. Some people say they're in shells. Some people say they're in orbit. Some people refer to them as electron cloud. The bottom line is it's not in the nucleus. It's moving around. It is very, very small. So we're already talking really small. The electron is really, really, really small. And then the neutron has a neutral charge, so no charge to it. It is also in the nucleus with the proton, and it does have some weight to it. There's different ways that you can draw this depending on which textbook you look at. So some people will draw here, the black is the neutron, the pink is the proton. They'll draw those together like this in the center, indicating that it's in the nucleus of the atom. And then the blue are the electrons, and they're floating around in these orbits, as I said, in these clouds. There's different ways of showing it. Once again, to try to give you some perspective of the size that we are talking about, is that uh, the size of a nucleus to the electron cloud, then it would be similar to the size of one blade of grass in a stadium 
So that's that's the size you're talking about. One little blade of grass down here. If this whole thing is the atom, the nucleus is is one blade of grass. That may or may not help you try to put some perspective on. Now each element has atomic numbers. This is the number of protons. Uh, usually the number of protons and the number of electrons are equal, so there's no overall charge. The mass number is the number of protons plus the number of the neutrons. And the atomic mass is the proton plus the neutron. Now isotopes, this refers to elements that have a different mass number. So they have the same number of protons and electrons, but they have different number of neutrons. And isotopes will behave the same in a chemical reaction, because from a chemical standpoint, it doesn't matter that there's a different number of neutrons in it. Now, some isotopes are what we call radioactive isotopes. And what this means is that that nucleus is going to decay spontaneously. As it decays, it gives off this radiation, gives off these particles. And this radiation is a form of energy. What type of energy is going to be given off and what type of particles are given off, it's going to be very specific for that element. So you can't say it's always this type of energy. Sometimes it's very strong, sometimes it's very low level. As with anything, there are benefits and harm, pros and cons for things. We do use radioisotopes a lot in research and also for some diagnostic purposes, but there is some harm that can be associated with them. So an example of some isotopes are with carbon. Carbon normally, we, most people refer to it as carbon-12. You have six protons, six neutrons, six electrons. With isotopes, as said, the protons and the neutrons, those numbers stay the same. The difference is here with the neutrons. Carbon-13 is an isotope of carbon-12, meaning it has a different number of neutrons. Will these carbons behave the same way? Yes, they will. Will they bind to the same things? Yes, they will. It doesn't matter that this has an extra neutron here. Now, carbon-14 is also an isotope of carbon-12, but specifically it is a radioisotope. Excuse me, which means it is going to give off energy and start to decay. You can measure this energy, this relatively low level energy. It does not, um, like, it's not strong enough to penetrate the skin. And this is an example of different levels of energy, and it just depends on which element you're talking about. Personally, I have worked with carbon 14. Um, there's precautions in training that you have to take before you work with any type of radioisotope. Carbon-14 <coughs> is one of the less harmful ones in terms of the amount of energy. It's very low level. Like I said, it cannot penetrate skin. Uh, when I worked with it, yes, you wore your gloves, you wore your lab coat, but you were wearing those anyway in the lab. Um, you can sometimes measure it with a Geiger counter. It's very low sometimes. It, it may not pick it up. The problem with carbon-14 is it has a very long half-life. Half-life means if you, let's just say you had a concentration, we'll just make it easy. Let's say you had a concentration of 10. The half-life is the time that it would take for that to break down. As I said, it spontaneously decays to half that amount, to five units. Well, for C14, carbon-14, the half-life is about, it's almost 6,000 years. So if you spill it, it's staying around for a long time. So that's the drawback to working with it. As I said, in terms of chemical reactions, say a bacteria, a fungus, your cells, they don't see the difference between any of these carbons. They just see this carbon. Personally, for me, when I was doing research, I was looking at various chemicals to see if bacteria and fungi could break these chemicals that are harmful chemicals found in the environment and in a form of what we call bioremediation, using microorganisms to break them down, to, uh, basically to solve contamination problems of these, these chemicals.
for me to test them, it was much easier, much quicker to get the compound, uh, which was a carbon-based compound. So I get the carbon and replace it with carbon-14. And then that way I could very easily measure if the bacteria was able to completely break it down, the waste product would be carbon dioxide, which is CO2. I could measure the amount of that carbon dioxide, and if that carbon on the carbon dioxide was radioactive, which I could measure, then the only place it came, could come from was from the carbon-14 compound that I fed it. So it can be very good for research purposes, for diagnostic purposes, because the organisms, like I said, whether it's the bacteria, whether it's yourself, use them in the same way. So we do use them in some diagnostic purposes. So since the cells don't distinguish between them, we can use them as tracers. We can follow various chemical reactions with them. So they can be beneficial. As I said, for every pro, there's a con. So some of the dangers is that, yes, this energy is being released when the chemical bonds are being broken. It can cause abnormal bonds to form. It can cause harm, especially to DNA. And so, like I say, depending on which element you're working with, um, you have to take training to work with any of them. But you really have to look at some of the energy released Excuse me, it's very, um, very strong. Some it's very weak. It's, I've worked with carbon-14. I've been in labs where I've monitored the uh, P32, phosphorus-32. That is a stronger energy one. The half-life is not very long, but uh, when, usually when you work with that, you have a piece of plexiglass in front of you because it can't penetrate the plexiglass. Then I have also helped labs set up where they were working with uh, cesium. And in that case, we stored the samples in a metal container, which was stored by itself in a refrigerator, a metal refrigerator. And that was the only thing that was in that lab. And when you walked in the lab, it was strong enough that if you had a Geiger counter on, you could pick up some of the radiation just by standing in the room, even though the sample was contained in a metal container in a metal fridge outside of that you could still pick it up. So what you have to do if you're in a situation whether you're developing testing that uses isotopes or whether you're doing research is you know what are the benefits? What information do you hope to gain from this and is it you know worth it versus uh, some of the dangers of working with these materials? A molecule is two or more atoms, such as two oxygen uh, atoms combined together. And then a compound is when you have two or more different atoms. So you would have oxygen and water, and hydrogen to make water. Or you would have, in this case, it's showing sodium and chlorine. <coughs> so elements are going to combine in a fixed ratio together to form a compound. And the compound may have very different characteristics than the elements that make it up. And an example of this is if you look at sodium in a natural environment, pure sodium is going to be a solid form like this. Chlorine at room temperature typically is a uh, liquid like this. Now oftentimes some of you may be familiar with under pressure it's a gas poisonous gas, and then you combine those in a one-to-one -one ratio and you get sodium chloride, <coughs> which is table salt. So obviously the, the properties and characteristics of this is very different than the components that make it up. Now we have oftentimes mixtures, and we are going to give them different names depending on what they look like and some of the properties. A solution is when you have a homogeneous mixture. You mix things together, it's going to be transparent. You cannot really see or distinguish the, the two components. With a solution, you have two things. You have a solvent and you have a solute. So the solvent would be the dissolving medium, such as water, and the solute is what's being dissolved. So. Uh, this could be, as an example, if you are making lemonade, 
um, or T, you've got the solvent would be water and then the solute would be the, the T or the powdered lemonade, etc. Colloid or emulsions, this is a heterogeneous mixture. Basically, it's translucent or it's kind of milky looking. Um, you can't see right through it. Suspensions, this heterogeneous mixture with very large visible, visible solutes that are going to oftentimes settle out. Um, this might be if you mix, I've known some people who will make sweet tea, which initially you'd say, okay, isn't that a solution? Well, the water is the solvent, the tea is the solute that's being dissolved in there. Then they add another solute, the sugar. And I've known some people who will put so much sugar in their sweet tea, you would have to call it a suspension. You start to see that sugar just starting to settle out on the bottom because there's, there's so much in there. Electrons. We're talking about the protons and the neutrons that are in the nucleus of the atom. And yes, they're there. But what we're going to focus mostly are on those electrons that have that negative charge that are floating around the nucleus. The arrangement of those electrons is what determines the chemical properties of that element. It's only the electrons that are involved in the chemical reaction. As you get further and further away from the nucleus, the energy starts to increase. And as I said, they're found in orbits or shells around that nucleus, and they are in constant motion. The number of electrons that are in this, the outermost shell, because they're in these orbits or the shells, and you have to completely fill the innermost one before you move to the next shell or the next orbit. In each orbit or each shell can only hold a certain specified number of electrons. So you're going to fill a shell, and then if you still have electrons remaining, well then they move to the next outer most shell or orbit. If that outermost shell is not filled completely, then that, that particular element is going to be considered reactive. If the outermost shell is filled, then it's unreactive. And this is what we, we call, we have different terms because they keep changing it. You may notice the noble gases, the inner gases, or the stable gases. They're all the same thing. They're unreactive. Why? Because their outermost shell is filled. Think of it as that is the goal of the element, is to become nice and stable and unreactive. How does it do that? It fills its outermost shell to completion. So how many electrons are we talking about? Well, the first innermost shell only has two electrons. The second shell has eight electrons. The third shell can also have eight electrons. That's usually about where we're going to be working. If you look at the periodic table, as you can see, there's a lot of elements here. Um, I believe the last time I checked, I think it's up to about 118 or 119 elements now. Several of the last ones, uh, about the last 20 or so, are man-made, and so they don't exist naturally. Are you going to have to know how many electrons are in all these now? This is not a chemistry class, so I'm not going to make you know that. But what I will tell you, <coughs> some of you may take chemistry in the past, in the future, some of you may have had it in the past. The periodic table, it's not just, oh, throw them together, you know, in a hurry, night before test, somebody decide, let me draw this up and make it look pretty. There's a set order to it, and it makes a lot of sense. And so if you ever take chemistry, let the periodic table become your best friend because it's going to tell you everything you need to know. So when I'm talking about the shells or the orbits, look over here. See how this is numbered? Your rows. Guess what? No, sometimes they'll call them periods. Here's chemistry in a nutshell. 
that is going to relate to the number of shells. So if you're in row one, right here, H, that is hydrogen. It only has, no, first off, it only has one electron. That one electron, it's out of a shell, it only has one orbit. If your sodium, which is Na right here, look at that, it's in row three. That means it has three shells to it. If you were down here, cesium, you're in row six, you have six shells. So the rows correspond to how many shells you have. Now the columns will refer to how many electrons you have in that outermost shell. So if you are in, we refer to them as groups, if you are in column one, which is group one right here, you have one electron in your outermost shell. If you're over here, well, let's go right here. C, that's carbon that we've talked about before some. That is in column four or group four. You can use whichever term right here. That means that it has four electrons in its outermost shell. Now, the number up here in the corner says six. That is going to tell you how many it actually has total. So it has two in the innermost shell, filled that to completion. The other four now go into the next shell, which is the second shell. You've got four in there in that outermost one now. How many does it need to fill to completion? Eight, because there's eight columns on this row. Over here, column eight, all of these, these are your inert or your noble or your stable glasses gases. These are the elements that have their outermost shell filled. Helium has two and the rest of these have eight. Because their outermost shell is filled, that means they are unreactive. They're perfectly happy they are filled to completion. Leave me alone. Don't make me interfere with, interact with anybody. I'm happy because I'm full. Your periodic table tells you everything you need to know. Remember when I said it's the electrons get further and further away from the nucleus? Think of the nucleus as being up here by the tidal. So this is your innermost shell. And as you move down, you're moving away from the nucleus, which means energy is increasing. So radon has more energy than carbon does. Periodic table, by like say, make it your best friend. It can tell you anything you need to know just by the way it's designed. Chemical bonds. These are interactions of electrons in those outermost shells. Because remember, it's only the electrons, and it's only the electrons in the outermost shell that will be involved with chemical reactions. What am I talking about interactions? Well, that means the electrons from one element, when it comes in contact with another element, either the same or different, it's either going to share those electrons, it's going to donate them, give them up, or it's going to receive electrons to fill that outermost shell. <coughs> There's three main types of bonds that we talk about with biology, ionic, covalent, and hydrogen. And the differences between them have to deal with what happens with the electrons. So ionic bonds are going to be formed. If, if you want to think of it as a two-step process, you can think of that. An atom is going to be giving up electron or receiving an electron. Ions or atoms or molecules have an electrical charge. Why do they have an electrical charge? Because they either gained or they lost electrons. If normally your electrons and your protons have the same number, so if normally I have three protons and three electrons, protons are positively charged, electrons are negatively charged. So overall, I'm usually neutral. But if I lose an electron, 
but I still have the number of protons. You, you don't change the number of protons, so you're not changing the, how many plus charges you have. So I still have three plus charges, but I just lost an electron, then that means I lost a negative charge, so now I have minus two, but a plus three, so overall I have a plus one charge. That makes me an ion. Why? Because I have a plus one charge. I have an electrical charge now. So when you have an ion that has a plus charge and you have another ion that if you receive an electron, you're receiving an, a, a negative charge, so it makes you a minus charge. Opposite charges attract, and that's what happens with ionic bonds. You have first ions that are formed. You either give up electron or you gain an electron. If you gave it up, you become positive charge. If you gain an electron, you become negative charge. And now the second step is that those opposite charges attract. And that, that attraction of those opposite charges, that's what an ionic bond is. So over here with sodium, Na is sodium, Cl is chlorine. And what happens is sodium has one electron in its outermost shell. It's in column one. Chlorine, which is in column seven, the electrons, which are these little blue dots here, they're usually in pairs. So you've got two, four, six, and seven in the outermost shell. You need eight to fill it up. So what happens is over here, the sodium would need seven electrons to fill this outermost shell to completion. That's an awful lot. That's hard to do. So why not just get rid of this extra one? So it donates the electron. Where does it go? It donates it to chlorine. So the sodium becomes a plus one charge. The chlorine is a negative one charge. Those opposite charges attract. So a bond is going to form here between the two. Of the various bonds, ionic in terms of strength will be the intermediate. Covalent bonds are going to be the strongest of the bonds that we talk about. So covalent will be the strongest, then ionic, and then hydrogen. And we'll talk about hydrogen in a moment. Covalent bonds, this is where the atoms are going to actually share those electrons in the atom of shell. Instead of somebody just completely giving up one, they're going to share them. So they do form very strong bonds. If you're sharing a pair of electrons, it's called a single bond. If you're sharing two pairs, so it's a total of four, it'd be a double covalent bond. And you could share three, it's not quite as common. Um, and here, like a triple bond is stronger than a double bond, a double bond is stronger than a single bond. So there's different ways of showing this. With hydrogen, it's, in, it's on row one, so it only has one shell. It only, it's kind of different from the other ones because it only has two electrons for maximum capacity on the, the shell. So you have two hydrogens. Each has an electron, so they're sharing them. Over here for oxygen, when you have, here's an oxygen atom, here's an oxygen atom, they're sharing pairs. And you can draw it different ways. You can draw it out with the shells, you can just draw it as a line drawing, or some people like to use models. If you are a very visual person and you like to see these models out like that, if it makes more sense to you, we're not going to spend a whole lot of time on this, but if it does help you, um, you can buy chemical model kits. When I was in school, I could never afford them. So what my friends and I would do, now I took a lot of chemistry, so we had to, to know a lot of this. But what we would do is we would buy a box of toothpicks, and then we would buy either basically a bag of candy. We'd usually buy either marshmallows or gumdrops, or you could use gummy bears now, whatever. Sometimes if we wanted to color code them, we would buy candy. So... And you use toothpicks to stick them together. And then when you get really frustrated with it, buy something you like and then you eat the candy. This is just showing in addition 
other examples of sharing of these. This is water down here. You're sharing a pair of electrons. So if you're actually sharing it, that's a covalent bond. Now, if it's equal sharing, it's known as nonpolar covalent. However, sometimes it's not an equal sharing. And that leads to certain what we call regional charges. Uh, why is it unequal sharing? Well, sometimes one atom's bigger than the other, and so it's stronger than the other. And so if it's stronger, it's going it's sharing the electrons, but it's not being fair about it. It's pulling it closer to itself. Electronegativity refers to the atom's attraction for those shared electrons. So in this case with water, the red is oxygen. It is much larger than the white hydrogen down here. And so you're going to share a pair of electrons with each of these. So there's a pair here and a pair over here of electrons being shared. But because hydrogen is so much larger, it's pulling those electrons closer to it and away from the hydrogen. I kind of equate this with um, with my kids, my son, who is almost 24 now. Uh, if you're playing tug of war with a sister who's 16, she's toast. It's, she's just a tiny petite gal, and he's big, and she's just going to be toast. Even if he's being nice about it, he's going to be pulling that they're playing tug of war closer to him. So. You're pulling the electrons that are negative charge. Yeah, you're sharing them, but you're pulling them closer to the oxygen here. So that means this side here will be more negative, and this side over here is going to be slightly positive now. So even though you have unequal sharing, it's still a covalent bond. It's just it's unequal in the sharing of it. This is going to lead to hydrogen bonds. Of the three bonds, covalent is the strongest, ionic is intermediate, and then hydrogen bonds will be the weakest ones. Now, hydrogen bonds can form between molecules, but it can also form within molecules, especially if it's a long, say, strand type molecule, it can kind of wrap around. It's a weak bond, however, it's very, very important. Uh, because the polar covalent bonds have that unequal sharing and leads to this partial positive and this partial negative areas, then those regional partial charges, opposite charges, will attract each other. And that's going to be what forms the hydrogen bonds. So once again, if we're looking at the water as we looked at previously, the red is the oxygen, the white is the hydrogen. Uh, the oxygen being much larger pulls those paired of shared electrons towards its end, so it becomes slightly negative. The white, the hydrogen has the electrons being pulled away from it, so on this side becomes slightly positive. Well, when you have a uh, glass of water, it's not just one molecule, it's literally millions of them, and so this is a water molecule, this is a water molecule, this is another one. And what happens is the slightly positive area here is attracted to the opposite charge, so a slightly negative area here. This dotted line right here indicates that that's a hydrogen bond. Why? Because one of the components is hydrogen. That's how it gets its name. Just by tradition, if there's a dotted line, that's usually indicative of a hydrogen bond. So in order to have a hydrogen bond, you have to have a polar covalent bond first. So you have to have polar covalent bonds here, causing those slightly regional differences and charges, and then the opposite charges attract, forming the hydrogen bonds. Now I will say this hydrogen bonds, even though they're weak, they are very, very important and don't think Oh, it's not that important. Yes, it is. One example is in DNA. It helps to hold the two strands of the DNA together. Now, moving on, if we talk about chemical reactions, the two pieces of this puzzle would be your reactants and your products. Your reactants, sometimes known as your substrates, that's what you're starting with. And then the products, that's the new substance that's formed.
There's different types of reactions. You can have a synthesis reaction or anabolic reaction where you are starting with two smaller things and you form a bond between these two, forming this compound. A decomposition or a catabolic reaction is bond breaking. So you're starting with a larger compound, you break the bonds, and you get these smaller components. A displacement or exchange reaction is when you have the combination sometimes of the two. So in here you would break the bond between A and B. Breaking that bond is the catabolic reaction. But then now you're going to form a bond between A and C, and so that's an anabolic reaction. You're synthesizing this. So you're taking the B off and putting the C on. So it's a combination reaction there. In chemistry, you may often hear about oxidation reduction reactions or redox reactions, how they're often abbreviated. And what they're looking at here is in a reaction, somebody's going to lose electrons and somebody's going to gain electrons. And so whatever is oxidized has lost electrons. Whatever is reduced gains electrons. And there's different ways of keeping it straight as to which one's losing, which one's gaining. The way I personally learned it was oil rig. Oxidation is loss. Reduction is gain. And once again, you're talking about the electrons. In terms of energy, uh, the reactions will be classified as either exergonic or endergonic. Exergonic reactions are going to be releasing energy. Typically, you're breaking bonds. So things like burning at a cellular level, cellular respiration, which is breaking glucose, which is a sugar dam. Endergonic reactions requires energy. Typically, you are forming bonds. An example is photosynthesis because you're taking water and carbon dioxide and you're, you're forming bonds to make sugar. Now, those two often will go together because if you require energy, where are you going to get it from? You'll get it from an exergonic reaction. So they're going to be paired together. When we look at the field of biochemistry, which is looking at chemistry as it relates to biology. Compounds will be divided as either organic versus inorganic. Inorganic compounds, what we're going to be looking at, <coughs> excuse me, uh, do not contain carbon. That you're talking about in terms of human biology, we'll be talking about water, salts, some acids and bases. Organic compounds will contain carbon, and we're going to be talking about carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. Now, when I say organic compounds do not contain carbon, there are a few exceptions to that. Uh, and so, but in, just be aware of that. But in terms of, of human anatomy and physiology, most of what we're looking at has carbon in it. It's organic. So we're going to start with the inorganic ones first. Water, we'll start with this. Water is a universal solvent. A lot of things can be dissolved in it. It has very unique properties to it that allows it to sustain life. Life as we know it is dependent upon water. Uh, it can resist temperature change. The density has some unique properties to it what we call cohesion and adhesion, being able to stick to things, and surface tension. Water is involved with the internal temperature control. Water is able to store a lot of heat in it, and that, that helps to keep your internal body temperature relatively stable. So regardless of what the external environment is, you're able to keep a moderate, uh, stable internal body temperature. So water is able to absorb a lot of uh, heat because it has these hydrogen bonds with it. When water evaporates, it takes heat with it. And that's what we call evaporative cooling. Basically, that's what happens when you sweat. When you get really hot, your body triggers you to start sweating. Why is that? Because as the water, as you sweat and that water is leaving you, when the water evaporates, it takes that heat with you. Um, 
when I lived out in the southwest part of the United States in New Mexico for over 20 years, a lot of places out there do not have air conditioning. And even though it gets really hot in the summer, what they have is an evaporative cooling system, which I don't know why, but for some reason they refer to them as swamp coolers instead of air conditioning. What you do is you basically have water that you pump over these pads and then you, you um, have a blower that's blowing air, pulling air into the house. That air passes over these wet pads. The water absorbs that heat from the air and uh, then it's, it blows the cooler air after it's passed through these water soaked pads. Um, that cooler air is then blown throughout the house to cool it down. In a low humidity section area, it's very effective. It can cool down to about 20, 25 degrees maximum cooler than what the outside temperature is. So, I mean, if it's 100 degrees out, it's not that effective, but it still gets it down to 80 inside. But it's the same principle as here when you're sweating. It carries that heat off of you. Um, salt. Salts are ionic compounds. However, when you, you know, so they are attracted by opposite charges. That's what's holding the, the components together. However, when you put them in water, the ions will separate. And so cations are positively charged molecules. Anions are negatively charged. This is very good because salts, um, sometimes when the anions separate in water, we call them electrolytes because they can conduct electrical currents. These play a huge role in a lot of the very uh, physiological functions in the body, as you're going to find out as you study through this course. Some examples are things like sodium, potassium, calcium. Um, and those levels need to be maintained at certain levels. A lot of them are going to be monitored in the blood. And so if it gets too low or too high, adjustments will be made. This goes back to homeostasis, uh, keeping them within certain levels. Uh, oftentimes they're needed to help generate electrical impulses, to send those nerve impulses, to stimulate whether it's muscles, glands, etc. Uh, for muscle contractions, you need to have certain levels of these maintained. And so it's very critical to monitor this. So water, as I mentioned earlier, is a great solvent. Um, it will surround. The size. So this is showing sodium chloride. They're held together by ionic bonds. But when you table salt, that's what it is. When you put it in water, it dissolves. What's happening is it just what we call dissociates. So you end up with the ions. You end up with the sodium with the plus charge, the chlorine with the negative charge. One reason why this is so important that this happens, that the water acts as a solvent and that this dissociates. Like I was just saying, you need to have certain levels of chlorine, and especially sodium, is monitored very closely. This large crystal of the sodium chloride compound is way too big to get inside the cell. It's just not going to get in. There's a size restriction. You cannot fit, you know. A, a huge thing into the cell. It's kind of like you cannot, I don't care how hard you try, you are not going to fit a full-size grand piano into a Prius. It's not going to fit. I don't care how you try to angle it, it's not going to work. This is just too big to fit inside the cell. It cannot fit. But you need these ions or electrolytes in the cell under certain conditions. So how are you supposed to get it in there? Dissolve it in water. This can pass through. This can pass through. This huge guy cannot. So how do you monitor this? I say the, the ion concentration or balance is going to be very, very closely regulated. You'll notice throughout this, uh, all of these chapters, they often have these little clinical, just to try to give you, okay, sometimes 
we're telling you what's supposed to happen, but there can be imbalances and this can lead to certain disorders and diseases. It's trying to give you some practical applications of why do I need to know this? Well, you need to be, once again, for maintaining homeostasis, maintaining that proper internal balance of all of these ions. How is it regulated? How is it monitored? A lot of them will be monitored in the blood. And where is it going to make adjustments in it? Oftentimes the kidneys are going to be a huge monitoring section. So that if you have too high of a concentration, what do you do? You get rid of it in your urine. Basically, you're going to pee it out. Um, if the levels are too low, the kidneys are going to be notified, basically saying, don't pee out all the sodium, we need it. Keep it in, put it back in the blood, don't put it in the urine. And so the kidneys are going to play a huge role in helping to monitor this. If the balance, either too high or too low, occurs, like I said, that's when disorders leading to diseases can occur. And ultimately, for some of them, it can lead to organ failure. So hopefully this is impressing upon you how important it is for the body to regulate. Now the hydrogen ions, hydroxide is OH and it has a negative charge to it. Both of these are, this is hydroxide ion, this is hydrogen ion. I understand some of you may not have had chemistry. Some of you who are listening to this may have had chemistry. So please just bear with us because we have the whole extreme. Some people had chemistry, but maybe it was a long time ago. And so um, just bear with me as I do some of these explanations for those that may never have had it. Both of these ions are very reactive. And this is going to lead to acid and bases. Acids and bases are both electrolytes, so they're going to ionize. They'll dissociate in water, just like what we saw with those ionic bonds, like the sodium chloride. Uh, acids, now if you've had chemistry, you'll know there's different definitions of acids and bases. Acids, from our purpose will be proton uh, donors. They're going to release hydrogen ions. And basically, they are going to lower the pH. So an acid uh, is going to release this hydrogen ion. As you see here, this would be hydrochloric acid, releases the hydrogen ion. Some of the more important acids that we deal with in AMP would be hydrochloric acid, acetic acid, carbonic acid is another. And then bases are going to be proton acceptors. They're going to pick up the hydrogen ions. Uh, when a base dissolves, dissolves in a solution, it releases the hydroxyl ion, that OH. Some of your important bases are bicarbonate ion and ammonia. <coughs> we use a pH um, scale to measure the amount of hydrogen ions in solution. Uh, so this way we can basically measure the acid concentration, the base concentration. The more hydrogen ions in a solution, the more acidic that solution is. Because they use a negative log and you don't have to worry too, too much about it, just know that your pH scale is logarithmic. Uh, so there's tenfold difference between numbers. So if you have a pH... Uh, solution of 4 and you have a pH solution of 5, the 4 is going to be 100 times more acidic than the 5, or excuse me, be 10 times more acidic. So your pH scale, what you need to be familiar is it goes from 0 to 14. Uh, acids are going to have a pH range of 0, basically the 6.99. So if it's less than 7, it's an acid. If it's at 7, then it's considered a neutral solution. If the pH is above 7, it is alkaline or basic. So remember, because it's doing negative log, it's, it's kind of inverse in that. The acidic solutions, if it's below 7, it has higher hydrogen ions, but a low pH. And then if it's an alkaline solution, it has... Uh, low hydrogen concentration. 
a high pH. This is just an example. You can find a lot of these online of a pH scale. Up here is 14 going down to 0. Right here at 7 is neutral. So this is your bases or your alkalines, and these are your acids. Just to give you some examples over here, uh, your blood, the pH is very closely monitored. Uh, on average, it's 7.4. It needs to be maintained between 7.35 and 7.45. Monitors it very, very closely. Uh, if you look down, lemon juice is about pH 2. Your stomach uh, gastric juices are about pH 2, which explains why, I know everyone wants to hear this, but if you are sick and you are vomiting, why does it burn when you vomit? It's because the stomach juices, the gastric juices, are at pH 2. They're coming up your esophagus, and that's burning because it is so acidic. Now, a lot of people know to be very careful at the lower pHs that you can get acid burns. And a lot of people forget that at the upper pHs, the very strong bases, you can also get burned very badly. So you need to be, and look what's up here, household ammonia, uh, bleach, oven cleaners. A lot of the cleaning supplies are up in this range. That is why if you read the fine print, which nobody wants to read, but it tells you to wear gloves. And you really should because this is very basic. You can get a severe burn. So please be careful when working with either extreme of the pH ranges. Neutralization, this is when acids and bases are mixed together. Um, it is a displacement type of reaction. And if you mix acid and base together, you end up with salt and water. Now I will tell you this. Uh, you have to know which acid and which base you can mix. This can be a very violent reaction. I have seen it before um, with someone that, that spilt some acid and they mixed base to neutralize it. And it did form this big old mound of salt and then water, which made it easy then to clean up. But you have to know what you're doing. And I'll be perfectly honest with you, when I was in school and I actually saw this, yes, it was really cool to see, but I'm also a big chicken, and I was standing right by the door so I could run in case it exploded or went wrong. So don't try this at home. <coughs> Buffers are essentially uh, solutions. What you need to know is right here, it does resist uh, large changes in the pH. In other words, you can, with um, say an acid, or you're mixing up a solution and you're adding acid to it, if you have a buffer there, the pH is not going to change very much. It resists that addition of acid. It's not going to have the pH drop. Or it will resist if you're adding a base. It resists the, the change in the pH. So in the, the human body, we do have several buffer systems to try to help maintain the, the pH. Regardless of what we're adding to it, the pH stays relatively um, stable. Moving on to organic compounds. Organic compounds contain carbon. Some exceptions to that would be carbon dioxide, which is CO2, and carbon monoxide, which is CO. Although those have carbon, they are considered or classified as inorganic. Usually organic molecules will have carbon and hydrogen with them. Uh, carbon has six electrons total, two in its innermost shell, four in its outermost shell. It needs eight in the outermost shell to fill it up. Well, it's hard to get rid of four. It's hard to gain four. You're right in the middle there. So carbon is always going to form covalent bonds because it's always going to be sharing bonds with other them. Uh, when we look at the various organic compounds, the Four major classes of them are carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids.
A lot of the organic compounds in these groups are going to be made up of uh, their polymers. And the way a polymer is made is you have similar units. Think of them as little building blocks that are called monomers. They build the it's kind of like getting a whole bunch of Legos and you build them up to make the larger compound. They are synthesized by dehydration reactions and broken down by hydrolysis reactions. So a dehydration <coughs> excuse me, reaction is what's going to happen is you have a monomer here, a building block. You have another monomer here. You're going to combine them together to make a larger compound here. So an anabolic reaction. And then the process is called dehydration because you're going to remove water. You take OH from one and hydrogen from another. It leaves this water. And you form your bond here. The reverse of that, so if you go back in the other direction, as shown here, is a hydrolysis. And in this case, you're going to be breaking this bond. So it's a catabolic reaction. You're going to take this larger compound. You're going to break it you're going to require water. So you have to put water into it. OH goes on one, H on the other. And then you, you can have combinations of these. So we talked first about carbohydrates. Carbohydrates are sugars, starches. <coughs> Excuse. They contain carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. The Carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen ratio is a 1 to 2 to 1. So for every one carbon, you would have two hydrogens and one oxygen. There's different classes of them, monosaccharides, disaccharides, and polysaccharides. Monosaccharides are just a simple one, simple sugar. They're the smallest unit or the building block of carbohydrates. Disaccharides are when you have two of these monomers connected together. And a polysaccharide just means... You have a bunch of them. So we look at the monosaccharides. These are the simplest sugars, usually having anywhere from three to seven carbon atoms. Uh, the general formulas, uh, as you can see here, CH2O, meaning for whatever number of carbons you have, multiply it by two, that's how many hydrogens you would have. And you would have the same number of carbons that you would oxygen. So glucose, which is the most common monosaccharide, most common sugar used, is C6H12O6. Uh, the monosaccharides do act as the monomers for the carbohydrates. You have some that have five carbons, so we call those a pento sugar. This would be ribose and deoxyribose. We will see those again when we talk about nucleic acids. And then hex, there are a lot of hexoses which have six carbons. The most common is the glucose. So some of the examples of the monosaccharides that are commonly found uh, and used in the, the body are things such as glucose, fructose, galactose, and then the pentoses. Here's deoxyribose and here's ribose. Do you have to know this formula? No, you do not. Carbohydrates, once again, continuing on. The disaccharides now, we have often referred to as the double sugars. Um, so you have two of those monomers together. They're going to be too large to pass through the membrane, so they're going to have to be broken down in order to get them inside the cell. Some of your more important ones are things like sucrose, maltose, lactose. Uh, you're going to have to, to break this down, like the sucrose, break it down to the two components to get it inside the cell. So here are some examples, once again, sucrose, maltose, lactose, that's commonly referred to as the milk sugar. This is the compound, uh, the sugar that if you're lactose intolerant, you do not make the enzyme that is necessary to break this down. So the body can't use the lactose. You need to break it down here. So you can't do that. And so you cannot carry out um, that reaction to break down right here. Polysaccharides are simply uh, 
where you have polymers of the monosaccharides, in other words, long strands of them. Some of the more important ones are starch and glycogen. They're not very soluble in water. Um, they're just so large. Starch, the difference between starch and glycogen, both of them are long chains essentially of just glucose molecules attached uh, end on end, making a long chain. Starches uh, from plants, plants make them when they have excess glucose, they just put them all in this long, it's like just adding them into the bank account, they just add them onto this chain. Glycogen is what animals will store carbohydrates as. So they also put the glucose on the chain, but it's a branching chain. That's the difference between them. Starch is not branching, glycogen is. And so <coughs> each one of these represents the glucose molecules. So you have excess sugar, just add it on the end. Just tack them on the end. But the glycogen as you can see, is this highly branching compound versus starch, which would just be long single chains. Lipids. These are fats. Uh, oils would classify in this as well. They do contain carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, but not in the same ratio as you see with carbohydrates. Sometimes they will also contain uh, phosphorus. They are insoluble in water, meaning they don't want to dissolve in water. They don't want to be anywhere near water. There are several different types of lipids. Your triglycerides, phospholipids, sterides, and eicosanoids. You start with triglycerides or neutral fats. Um, fats, when they're solid, oils, when they're liquid. They are composed of three fatty acids, which are bonded to a glycerol molecule. The main function for them, because you do need to have some of this for energy storage, for insulation, and for protection. Now, some of these triglycerides um, are comprised of saturated fatty acids. A saturated fatty acid is when all of the carbons on the chain are linked by a single covalent bond. They tend to be solid at room temperature. Your unsaturated fatty acids, at least one of the carbons has a double bond. So it's not at its maximum number of hydrogen atoms. They tend to be liquid at room temperature. The trans fats are modified oils. They tend to be healthy. And the omega-3 fatty acids are what is considered the hard healthy ones. So with your triglyceride, if you look at this, the glycerol, glycerol, glycer in chemistry, glycer, anytime you see that think of three carbons, it's a three carbon chain. So glycerol, glycerate, glyceraldehyde, all those have three carbons. So this is your glycerol. And then you have your um, three fatty acid chains that you're going to attach to that glycerol on there. Phospholipids are modified triglycerides. You still have a glycerol, and you're going to have now two fatty acid um, chains attached to it, plus a phosphorus group. And so we have different regions that we refer to as the head and the tail. The tail is the area with the two fatty acid chains on it. It is nonpolar, and it's hydrophobic. It doesn't want anything to do with water. It doesn't want to be near water. It's repelled by it. The head area is a polar region and it is attracted to water, so it's what we call hydrophilic. Phospholipids are a major, major component of the cell membrane and helping the structure of that. So once again, you have that glycerol and you have your fatty acid chains over here. And then you have a phosphorus group over here. So this phosphorus group is the head. That's what mixes with water. But the tail is hydrophobic. That's the fatty acids that do not want to mix with the water at all. Notice right here you have a double bond. And so that's where we're talking about the distinction between whether um, if it's saturated and all the bonds are single bonds, these tails can all line up very neatly very parallel without any kinks. 
if it's unsaturated, it has a double bond in here. And now it's drawn here as well. It gets that little kink in it. Steroids. Steroids consist of, uh, it's a large ring structure. There's going to be four rings that are connected together. And then you may have structures beyond attached to those four rings. But the very base of it will be four rings that are interlocked or connected together. Um, some of your common steroids are things such as cholesterol. It's often, cholesterol is actually often used as a template for making other steroid compounds from it. Vitamin D is a steroid. Hormones, a lot of your hormones are steroid based. Bile salts. So cholesterol gets a bad rap. And it's one of those things you need to have a certain amount of cholesterol that your body makes because <coughs> it's used to help stabilize the cell plasma membrane. And it's used as a template for making some of these other steroid compounds, such as some of your hormones, such as things like vitamin D, etc. So this is uh, cholesterol. So these are the four interlocking rings that we're talking about that's used as a template for making many of your other steroid compounds. So you need to have some cholesterol. The problem is a lot of us have way too much. And then eucosanoids are derived from fatty acids. They're found in cell membranes. Uh, a lot of these are prostaglandins that will play a role in, uh, with blood clotting, helping with uh, blood pressure, dealing with inflammation, and things such as that. So you've had your carbohydrates, your lipids. And in terms of cellular physiology, so down at the cellular level, if a cell needs energy. Its number one choice is to use the carbohydrates. If carbohydrates are not present, then it will use the lipids for energy. It will break them down. If lipids are not present, so no carbohydrates, no lipids, then the cell can start to break down proteins. But at this point in time, you're at a starvation level. You're in trouble. And let's say you're talking about at the cellular level here. Proteins, they comprise 20 to 30 percent of the cell mass. They have a lot of different functions. They're involved with just about every aspect of the cell. They're helping with structure. They're helping with a lot of the chemical reactions going on. They contain carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, sometimes sulfur, sometimes phosphorus. Uh, they have as their monomer, amino acids. So these amino acids are the building blocks to make the larger peptide. Um, typically, if you have about 100 amino acids connected together, we call it a peptide. Once it's over about 1,000, then we refer to it as a protein. <clears throat> the shape and the function is going to be determined to different structural levels that we will get into. So, as I said, the building blocks for proteins are amino acids. There are 20 types of amino acids um, that have to be joined together in a specific order to make each specific protein. The amino acids will be connected or joined together by a covalent bond. Now, I know we just went over that there's covalent, ionic, and hydrogen bonds. And now I'm throwing out a peptide bond. So you might be thinking, where is she coming up with that? I know, we, we tend to, uh, to throw these things out. I'm sure you guys are thinking, oh, she's annoying us again. Here we go. A peptide bond is a covalent bond. Specifically, it is a covalent bond between two amino acids. Why do we give it a special name? Well, if somebody tells me a peptide bond, I automatically know you're talking about between two amino acids, so you're talking about formation of protein. Could you just said a covalent bond between amino acids? Yeah, but that's like I say, part of this tradition, just go with it. <clears throat> an amino acid is going to contain both an amine group and an acid group. Um, 
And the differences between the 20 amino acids have to do with what we call the R group. So your standard amino acid, you will have this central carbon right here. You will have an amine group off to one side. That is your nitrogen with two hydrogens on it. Completely opposite from that, because remember, carbon can have four bonds. They're always going to be covalent. So you've got your amine group here. Directly opposite from it will be this acid group, which is another carbon, double bonded oxygen, and then a hydroxyl group over here. Just know you've got your amine group here, your acid group here. Then you're going to have a hydrogen here. So all 20 of your amino acids have this. The only thing that's different is what we call the R group, which is this green box up here. It may be as simple as a hydrogen. It may be as complex as a ring structure. But that is the only thing that's going to be different. And so what happens, <coughs> excuse me, in the formation of a peptide bond is once again you have an amino acid here, you have an amino acid here by dehydration reaction. You form this covalent bond right here. And yes, that's what we call a peptide bond. Now we have different structural levels of proteins. There's four different levels. We refer to them as the primary, the secondary, tertiary, and quaternary structures. The primary structure is simply what is the sequence of amino acids? Think of it like a long chain. Just what is it? Is it glycine, alanine, glycine, or is it glycine, valine, alanine? What, what is that sequence of those amino acids? The secondary structure is going to be determined by what the primary structure is. Each one's determined by the previous one. This is where you're having some interactions between some of the amino acids. You may get some regional folding and twisting. The two most common things that we see are what's known as an alpha helix, which looks like a coil, kind of like a slinky, and then a beta pleated sheet, which is where you have kind of a zigzagging type structure. The tertiary structure is going to be part of your 3D structure, and then the quaternary structure is beyond that. So if we look a little bit more detail, once again, primary structure, what is that sequence? Amino acid A, B, C, D, E, etc. Secondary structure, your alpha helix. And this now often involves or is formed, notice here these little dotted lines. Remember I said that's indicative of hydrogen bonds. So you're getting this interaction between an amino acid here and one over here. So that alpha helix, like I said, it kind of looks like a slinky. And then a beta pleated sheet, you get kind of this zigzagging. One way to visualize it is, remember when you probably all were kids and you are hot and you took a sheet of paper and you folded it up and you made a paper fan? It's kind of that type of folding. It's not the entire protein, it's just in certain areas. And so the tertiary structure is now, what is the three-dimensional structure of the protein? For some proteins, this is it. And so if you look at the protein, you may have, you've got your, your chain of amino acids, and in some areas, like right here, you have an alpha helix. It's not the entire thing. It's just in a certain area. You might have an area right here with a beta pleated sheet, another area here with a pleated, uh, beta pleated sheet. So those secondary structures are just small little regional areas. It's not the whole protein. How it all fits together in that 3D structure is the tertiary structure. Like I said, for some proteins, this is it. Some proteins, however, have essentially these various subunits that then fit together. And in this example that they're showing, there's actually four subunits that have to fit together to give the overall structure with the subunits, and that is the coordinary structure.
Overall, the shapes of proteins fall into either fibrous or globular. Fibrous are often structural proteins. They tend to be very stable, water insoluble. Um, as the name implies structure, they're helping to give support and strength. Globular proteins are often called functional proteins. They tend to be very compact. They tend to be water soluble, so they're sensitive to environmental changes. Uh, things like antibodies, some of your hormones, and enzymes. When proteins denature, what we're talking about here is that the overall three-dimensional structure is altered. So that the proteins, like the globular proteins, tend to unfold and they lose that, that three-dimensional structure. Now, fibrous proteins tend to be a little bit more stable, but how do they unfold? Well, maybe there's been a change in temperature. There's been a change in the pH. Um, if it happens very slowly, oftentimes it is reversible, but there is a certain point where it's done, it's done. Um, and remember, this goes back to structure determines function. So if you're, you're unfolding and the protein is losing its three-dimensional shape, it's losing its structure, which means it's going to lose its function. It's no longer functional. If proteins can't function, they can't carry out their uh, purpose. A lot of them act as enzymes to allow chemical reactions to occur. If chemical reactions cannot occur, then the cell cannot maintain at the level it's supposed to, and it's going to die. Now, what are some examples of denaturing proteins? You're familiar with it, though you may never have thought about it this way. <coughs> so a lot of protein in an egg whenever you cook an egg. Like the white of the egg, when you cook that and it changes color, what are you doing? Well, then say, I'm cooking my breakfast. Well, from a chemical standpoint, you're denaturing the protein. Uh, if you perm your hair, a lot of your hair is protein. You've denatured the protein. So those are just some everyday applications of it. Enzymes. Enzymes are a group or a class of proteins. They act as a catalyst, meaning they can help increase the rate at which a chemical reaction will occur. They will not be used up or altered themselves in the process. They're you, for a reaction, chemical reaction to occur, you have to put in a little bit of energy. And essentially what it does, it's going to lower the amount of energy you have to put in. And then that's going to essentially speed up um, the reaction. So without the enzyme, a reaction might take, you know, 10,000 years. But it can take a millisecond with the enzyme there. So they really speed up the reactions allowing for survival. In terms of the characteristics of the enzymes, uh, most of them have um, what we call cofactors or coenzymes that will assist, basically be like helpers with the reaction. Cofactors tend to be metals, coenzymes, or, or uh, organic, oftentimes vitamins. Enzymes are very, very specific as to the substrate that they will work on. Usually if you see a word name ends with A-S-E, that's an enzyme. And there's a specific name system that is used. So the enzyme is going to lower this amount of energy that you have to put into the reaction to get it started, which is known as the activation energy. And then it allows it to uh, proceed very quickly. So normally what's going to happen is you have the substrate bind to the enzyme. It's going to bind in a very specific area called the active site. It's kind of like the enzyme is a keyhole and the substrate is a key. The key has to fit into the keyhole. Um, it's a very specific, it binds to it and it's going to form a complex. Whenever you have two things bind together, there is just about always a shape change that is going to occur. And this 
in this process of the enzyme binding to the substrate, you have a shape change, and then your product is going to be released. When the product is released, the enzyme converts back to its original shape so it can be reused again. So this is just showing without an enzyme the amount of energy that you would have to put in for that reaction to kind of jump start it to get it going. But with the enzyme, notice it's much, much lower. And then in this diagram, it is showing how you have the propolis, the enzyme, the active site are these spots right here, the keyholes, if you will. Here come the keys. These are the substrates. They're going to bind. Okay, great. They fit into the keyhole. If they didn't, they would just bounce off. You have a slight shape change, notice. It doesn't have to be major, it's just a slight shape change once the substrate has bound. You form your bond, you release the product. When the product is released, you have another shape change. Anytime anything binds or is released, there's always going to be, a, we often refer to it as a conformational change. It's a shape change. This goes back to the original shape and can be, here we go again, reused again. So this is just showing in detail, binds, shape change, release of the product. Enzyme goes back to its original shape to be reused. So you talked about carbohydrates, lipids, and proteins. Your fourth group of your organic molecules or macromolecules as they're often referred to as are your nucleic acids. These would never be used as an energy source. At the cellular level you wouldn't survive to this point. If you've exhausted carbohydrates, lipids, and you've gone through all your proteins, you, you wouldn't by the time you only are using proteins for energy, you're already in starvation mode anyway, so you wouldn't survive to just having nucleic acid. So you would never use that for an energy source. Your nucleic acids are composed of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and phosphorus. They are the largest molecules in the body. Their uh, monomers are called nucleotides. So what in the heck is a nucleotide? You have uh, a phosphate group. You have a pentose sugar, so five carbon sugar. And then you have what's known as a nitrogenous base. It just means you have a compound, as you'll see in a moment, that has nitrogen in it. There are two major classes, your deoxyribonucleic acid, which is known as DNA, and then your ribonucleic acid, which is RNA. DNA contains all the genetic information. Typically, it is double-stranded. So we call it a double helix. It's in a uh, twisted shape, so it's a double helix. Uh, with our cells, it is located in the cell nucleus. Now, I'm just going to say this. DNA, usually you'll see, is often listed as, oh, it's always a double helix. It's always double-stranded. Um, as a microbiologist, I'm just going to caution you to say there are some viruses that are single-stranded. DNA, just so you're aware of that. Viruses never read your a &P book. They never read a single biology book, so they don't really know what the book says, and they frankly don't really care. So they go by their own rules. Nucleotides uh, contain the deoxyribose sugar phosphate group, and then those nitrogen bases, there are four of them that can be found in DNA. We Subdivide them into two groups, purines and pyrimidines. Purines, there's two of them, adenine and guanine, and then the pyrimidines are cytosine and thymine. So those are your four nitrogenous bases. And you'll notice that just by tradition, and I don't know, maybe it's because we're lazy, we don't like to write stuff out, but we tend to abbreviate them with a capital letter using the first letter, so A, G, C, and T. So as I said, DNA is containing all the genetic information. Uh, the way the two strands are going to be held together is very, very specific. It's going to, the two strands are held together by hydrogen bonds. Remember, this is the weakest of the bonds, but it's very important. And I'll just let you know right now, one of the reasons why it's hydrogen bonds here is because the two strands, anytime the cell needs to make protein, 
That information is on the DNA. So you're going to have to separate those two strands apart, or at least a region of it, to get the information on how to make the protein. And then it's kind of like you're going to unzip a little portion. Okay, get the information, now zip it back up again. So you're constantly breaking and then putting it back together. If you're going to be breaking something, breaking bonds, that requires energy. So doesn't it make sense to have the weakest bond holding the two strands together? Therefore, it takes less energy to break those bonds. Ah, starting to make a little bit of sense here. Um, you could say the cell is very, very efficient. I often say, I use this in my microbiology quite a bit, I'm saying, you know, if you stop and think about it, here's some food for thought. Isn't there a fine line between efficiency and laziness? If you think about it, the cell doesn't want to spend a lot of energy if it doesn't have to. So do not have the two strands of DNA held together by a covalent bond. The individual strands have covalent bonds, but not between them, because that's going to take a lot more work and energy to separate them. And if I have to constantly separate them, I don't want to do all that work. Make it a little bit easier. So it will be hydrogen bonds that are holding the two strands together. And it's very specific as to how it's going to be held together. On the strands, you have alternating sugar and phosphate groups. And then the bases, those nitrogenous bases from one strand, are pointing inward towards the nitrogenous base of the adjacent strand. So the hydrogen bonds are between those bases from one strand to the other. And as you can see here, we have what we call complementary base pairing rule. A always binds with T, and G and C will always bind together. And I can tell you, A and T always bind together with two hydrogen bonds, and G and C always binds together with three hydrogen bonds. I don't care if you're talking about your cell, a bacterial cell, a plant cell, a fungal cell. This is universal. And so with DNA here, as you can see, drawn out, here is a nucleotide. So you have a phosphate group. You have the deoxyribose sugar right here. And then you have the nitrogenous base. So you've got a phosphate, a sugar, and the base. In this case, the base is A. So that's what's on this strand. On the adjacent strand, right across from it, you're going to have T. Notice you have two hydrogen bonds holding them together. The double helix, and this is hydrogen bonds between the bases all the way down. So if you know the base sequence, such as down here, T, G, G, T, and on around, if you know the base sequence of one strand, you automatically should be able to figure out what the opposite strand is because of this complementary base pairing rule. A and T always go together, G and C always go together. A and T are always held together by two hydrogen bonds. G and C are always held together by three hydrogen bonds, always. Now RNA is going to be made using DNA as a template. Uh, usually RNA is single-stranded. It's going to be found outside of the nucleus. Now, once again, there are, just so you know, there are some RNA viruses that are double-stranded RNA. Once again, to play by different rules. RNA contains the sugar ribose. And in terms of the basis, it has adenine, guanine, and cytosine, but it does not have thymine. It still is going to have the base uracil. Now, uracil and, and adenine will still be complementary bases. But if you see a base sequence, if somebody said, oh, here is um, A, C, G, G, A, A, U, A, U, 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 A, whatever. And it's, can be, trust me, thousands of bases, millions of bases actually in the base sequence. If there's a U in it, you know it's RNA. But if there's a T in it, you know it's DNA. Now, in 
In our class, we're going to be looking at three main types of RNA. They're going to be involved with uh, protein synthesis, the making of proteins. We have messenger RNA, which we abbreviate as mRNA. We have transfer RNA, which we refer to as tRNA. And we have ribosomal RNA, which we refer to as rRNA. So those are the, there's more types than that, but those are the three types we'll look at. And then ATP. <coughs> ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate. What you need to think of when you see ATP is energy. This is the form that energy is used most often in any cell, not just human cells, but any cells. So when we look at the structure of ATP, you have adenine, just like what we saw with the RNA and the DNA. You have ribose, so this is the same sugar that you see in RNA. And then you have three phosphate groups attached. If there's just one phosphate group, it's adenine, adenosine monophosphate, or AMP. If you have two phosphate groups attached, it's adenosine diphosphate, or ADP. And then ATP, adenosine triphosphate, so if you have three. These bonds between the phosphate groups here are very high energy. So when you break that bond and you release the phosphate group, it releases a lot of energy. And that's what the cell is using to carry out different reactions. Now, if it has excess uh, phosphate groups, it doesn't need any, any energy right now, and you've got ADP, stick a phosphate back on it to make ATP. So you're going to see the cell will break this off and then later put it back on and then break it off. So it's constantly moving it back and forth. So once again, just saying that ATP is energy. And that's what it is showing here. You remove that phosphate group off, you have ADP, and that releases energy. You have excess energy, put it back on, store it for later use. So you will find throughout the semester as we go into detail later on with some of the different systems and the physiological processes that are occurring that sometimes the uh, cell has what we call transport work where the ATP is uh, phosphorylating on proteins. Basically it's using the ATP to help transport various uh, proteins, various ions across the membrane that need help to move across. Sometimes it's mechanical work that you're using ATP to help with muscle contraction. Sometimes you're using the chemical work, you use ATP for helping to drive certain reactions, whether it's building substances from smaller compounds. So that is going to be chemistry, like I said, in a nutshell, probably more than you wanted to hear. But like I said at the beginning, understanding some of these, these basic chemical processes will make the physiology more understandable because physiology is essentially it's chemistry. It's biochemistry, looking at chemistry in the biological systems. And so this is just enough to, to hopefully make it a little bit easier as we progress uh, through this material.